Just kidding. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. So we present to you guys Project Hallmark, or how it was for the now is three. Three, three men learn to stop worrying and love electricity. This is what we got. Let's uh, let's start the task. Oof. Um, Thank you, Ben. All right, I got this, Patrick. Right. So our task was divided into three parts: the design and construction of a linear homopolar motor, determining the efficiency of the design by our expected values versus our actual values, and to identify areas for improvement, of which there are plenty. All right, so uh, we figured since this is kind of a foreign concept to a lot of you and it took us a while to understand how everything works, we'd explain to you how everything works. Overall, Hallmark, which is a high acceleration linear homopolar motor, the K doesn't stand for anything, it just sits there to make it a word and sound better. It uses a high voltage pulse of power to generate high currents in the rails and the armature, which makes magnetic fields, as we all know, currents make magnetic fields. And those fields interact to produce an acceleration on the armature. I'll explain all the different components in depth when Jonas clicks the button. All right, so the first thing that we have, there's, there's three real big parts, is the energy storage unit, which is that guy right there. That is, is, is the heart of Hallmark. It's, it's what it produces. It stores and it produces all of the power for the entire structure. You can't power this off of like your standard 120 volt outlet because that just doesn't produce enough current. Go big or go home, guys. So uh, that's also divided into three parts. The first one is the charging circuit, which is that little box right there. That uses what's called a voltage multiplier, which is a series of capacitors and diodes <coughs> wired up like this, if you guys can actually see that. How oh, cool it works. And that uses alternating current to step it up. It multiplies it by whole number values to get a larger amounts of DC current. So the way that this works it's a little funny because when you hear someone talk about a 120 volt outlet, that's not producing a peak voltage of 120 volts. They describe uh, alternating alternating current. God, I can't talk. Is described by something called RMS voltage. It's like sort of an average voltage overall. Of the, it's a measure of the power that you're getting out, which is more useful for normal stuff. But when you do this, you have to use the peak voltage, which is the RMS voltage times. I was going to write stuff on the board, but it's a stupid idea. And it's going to take effort. The RMS voltage times 1.414, which means that, that that outlet over there, which the computer appears to be plugged into, produces voltages that go between positive 157 volts and negative 157 volts. So, that, and don't plug that in, Max, please, not yet. That times 5 is about um, 820, 830 volts, which is the maximum voltage rating of that bank of capacitors. You can sort of see how it works here. The, uh, the red represents the positive side of the outlet, the blue represents the negative side, and because it's alternating, they switch back and forth. And after a couple of microseconds, the entire circuit charges up, and you have 840 volts on those two terminals, which is pretty exciting. That makes sense to everyone? Sort of? I see nodding heads and a couple blank stairs. We'll move on. The advantages of this over a transformer is that it's lighter, it's cheaper, and it's easier to build custom, because I looked everywhere and I could not find a transformer that took 120 volts and stepped it up to 840 volts. Just nope, not for us. Because it's not a normal thing. It's to it's do. not a normal thing to do. Most people oh, don't well. build high acceleration layer so homes and cars in their homes. All right. So the next thing is the capacitor network, which is the uh, the the big part of that box there. There's two layers of 200 capacitors. Each capacitor is rated for a maximum of 420 volts and has a capacitance of 120 microfarads. That's a lot, even though it says micro in there. We have 200 of them. They're wired in an arrangement so that there are two sets of capacitors in series, like um, every capacitor has another one in series with it, and there are 100 sets of those. It's a two series, 100 parallel arrangement. And, uh, so it can withstand 480, 840 volts max, and has a total capacitance of 0 .006 farads, which is absolutely massive. When that is fully charged, it stores over 2,000 joules of energy, which is a fair amount of energy to store in capacitors. The advantages of a capacitor system over batteries is that it can let out a lot more power. When you, um, 
you ran into this problem when you called me up over the weekend. You had trouble with your nine volt battery powering both the laser and the motor because there's it just it couldn't push out enough power. Because as you try and draw more current from the battery, the internal resistance increases, voltage drops, and you run into all sorts of problems. That doesn't have that problem. We uh, did a couple of rapid discharge tests with that, and uh, it was pretty exciting. It was a lot of fun. You'll you'll see what that looks like later. Um, yeah, disadvantages don't matter. There are no disadvantages. That's perfect. Uh, and then there's an emergency discharge circuit on top, which is that series of light bulbs there. There's four light bulbs, two in series, two in parallel, and there's a really big resistor in the bottom there. That's just in, um, in case of emergency or in case we don't feel like shooting at people, we, uh, we can discharge all of the energy. We don't actually shoot at people. We never feel like shooting. We never feel like shooting. That's not a thing that could happen. You know, just clarifying that. So this allows the bank to actually like be safely used and safely discharged without actually firing Hallmark. What nice happens if you shoot at someone? You don't. We, we you don't. You want this. And nothing so happens. Stop, Megan. But that's disgusting. It, we, why would you do that? That's a stupid idea. Uh, but if so, in, in the, with the test we got, it's not incredibly powerful, like kinetically, uh, because we're only shooting at like 60% or 55%. So yeah. it's not, not life-threatening. Yeah, you, you probably, you might get a bruise, that's about it. Your paintball. Yeah. Alright, so the next system, if um, my other Vena White would hold up the pneumatic injection system, don't squeeze the trigger because I don't want to waste the pressure. But all that is, is a metal tank that stores air and a, a, just a, a switch, a trigger, whatever you want to call it. That stores uh, 120 PSI compressed air, it's enough for one shot. And that is used to give the uh, the armature a little bit of pre-acceleration before it ends in, ends up inside the housing of Hallmark itself. This greatly lowers the cost of the design and also greatly simplifies it. This allows uh, using a pneumatic injector allows us to have a what can be termed as a hot rail design. The rails in that are always connected to the power supply, which means that we do not have to buy an extremely high power switch because extremely high power switches are a hard to find, b very large, and C, very expensive, like on the order of thousands of dollars. We don't have thousands of dollars, so we did this. In addition, it also minimizes the chance of the projectile actually welding to the rails, which is possible when you use extremely high currents, like in this design. And it's fairly effective at that overall. We did have a couple problems, but you know, hey, it happens. And it actually leads to a more efficient design overall, because compressed air is slightly more efficient as accelerating at lower speeds than this design is. Therefore, you use the compressed air to get an initial velocity, which is no trouble at all, and Hallmark itself to actually get it going super fast. Next slide. And then, the linear electromagnetic accelerator. Hallmark itself. That thing right there. It's beautiful, it's wonderful. If you were to take its top off, it would look like that. You can't really see, because the top is on and I don't really feel like taking it off because it takes quite a while. There's a lot of bolts on there. So, uh, as, as I said before, it uses magnetic fields to accelerate the projectile, or armature, as we refer to it, because armature sounds better. Um, you'll know, you'll remember Lorentz forces, right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's what it uses. This uh, is a super handy diagram right here of how they all work. You can see the path of the current, you can see the direction of the fields generated, and it's uh, it's uh, super cool. Does that make sense, sort of, to everyone? You know how, like, when you have the two fields going in different directions, they push away from each other. Yeah. It flies out the barrel. One really interesting thing is it doesn't matter which way you hook up the power wires to this. The projectile or armature will always travel away from where you hook up the, the uh, power rails. So that actually makes it a lot simpler and a lot safer to hook up, which because you know, if you hook it up wrong, it's not going to explode or anything. It's just going to function as it normally does. Uh, back. And I was going to write equations in there, but Microsoft Word wasn't working, and it was like 12 o'clock at night, so I decided <laughs> to call it quits. And it. <laughs> we but uh, well. it, if you want to look at your equation sheet, it was just going to be uh, F equals B I L, and the uh, mu I over 2 pi R equals B. Slide. All right, so the procedure. Uh, just want to start us off on the procedure? Yeah, so um, this is how I built it. You know, uh, first we built the capacitor bank. This took a while because of just the sheer how many capacitors we had to do. Um, as you can see, we had a pretty large soldering iron there. 
um, to get the, I think it was 10 gauge mm -hmm. uh, fully stripped copper wire on like, kind of like a rail along the terminals there. You can see, if you zoom in right to that picture, you can see how we had to solder at each, at each terminal as well as bend a little uh, copper wire in order to get it into um, uh, pairs. That took um, a good week. Yeah, so it's it's a, a very it's incredibly tedious. When you're soldering, since you're dealing with high heat, to be safe, you want to make sure that while you're soldering it, you don't have to be holding the capacitor so you're not there very long, because the capacitors don't like high heat. So you have to, first off, get everything bent the right way, tape it all together, then solder it, and if it comes apart, then you has got to start over. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we had to build two sets. As you can see, there are two pairs on the box. We also had to build the box. So yeah. Max and Jonas did a great time with that. They yep. built a wonderful box. The idea with our uh, cute. the idea with this design is that because we can, because uh, it's we want to make sure that everyone can see what's happening because it's, it's a project we're trying to teach people about how these sort of uh, linear accelerators work. So this way you can see each layer and see all the capacitors and all that. Now in the actual accelerator you can't do that because we need strong materials to hold everything together. Yes. But where we can we try to make it as uh, see through as possible. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the charging and discharging circuits were constructed in the same sort of manner. They have uh, polycarbonate cases rather than acrylic because I happen to have polycarbonate, not acrylic. That really doesn't matter. Uh, again, they were made clear so you can see inside them and see how they work. Uh, you know, it's a lot more soldering to do. It's always involved in that. This is the fun part. This is the building of the actual accelerator housing, which is a uh, round thing on the table. Maxine will hold up and show. We have all sorts of beautiful pictures. I We designed it up in SolidWorks and printed out these, which are detailed sheets of how every single part needs to be cut exactly where each hole needs to be drilled, which greatly simplified construction. Although, since we're not professional machinists, we still ran into a few problems. The great thing about using those the, these, uh, these schematic uh, drawings is that we don't have to have the person who, like, who thought of exactly what the piece. So, so for example, if Patrick designs the, this end piece, he doesn't have to be there telling us, all right, we need a hole here, here, and here. These schematics tell us exactly where we want every single hole to be, and that way we can hand it to anyone who knows how to use a uh, drill press or whatever, and they can cut the pieces for us, or they can help the person do this when they know exactly how to do it, which is really nice and helpful. Also, we can see right here Max's contribution to our work. Yes, uh, lots of chilies, chili. Ian, uh, that's a good thing. Good. Yes. We also have a video that we can show you, but it's not really necessary. Yeah, we'll just skip on to the more yeah, fun stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. All right. Shoot it. I can talk about this one. Um, for testing, um, we examined each component individually before testing the entire system. Um, we then had to make a chronograph, which is basically um, two uh, conductive substances that you can break through and time the difference that it takes for the projectile to break through one and the other. Um, we made we basically wove, uh, we trusted a design uh, that used solder and also a uh, very high gauge wire. Um, and uh, we were going to have a uh, mechanism that hooked up in time to this. However, uh, problems during testing arose and uh, the projectile didn't have, enough, have high enough energy to use this apparatus and also the apparatus itself was not functioning at the time. So we were not able to get data from that. Um, However, we still have video of our three tests. Woo! All right, so uh, our first test was conducted at 420 volts, which is one quarter power. Because the power of the bank, well, the energy of the bank is proportional to the square of the voltage, charging it to half voltage is actually charging it only to a quarter charge. Do we have volume right now? Uh, yeah, do we have volume? I don't know. Does this have volume? Uh, I don't know whether it's turned out or not. Oh. Well, that's going to make one of the videos a lot less impressive. Uh, no, yeah, we kind of need volume. We yeah, it's just go to the task guide. That's fine. That's good. <coughs> okay, so I <laughs> so that was um that was her first test. That was also her first successful test. It was wonderful. You saw the uh, you saw the muzzle flash. You saw the sparks. You saw the projectile come out and hit the towel. It was super great. We were super pumped. We were super excited. Yeah. Then came the second test. Yeah. Uh, Watch this. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna go on a side, but that doesn't really matter. Sweet. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs>
Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> we had a little problem here. When we charged it up to 550 volts, there was something inside the capacitor bank, like a fine strip of wire or a tiny little ball of solder that was sitting right next to two terminals, and 550 volts was enough to bridge the gap between that fine piece of solder and the terminal. What that sound was, was the entire capacitor bank discharging through that small point, Ooh, vaporizing that connection, <laughs> and making a very large noise and flash of light. I almost peed my pants because I was the only one out there. It was really scary. After that happened, we took the entire capacitor bank apart, I inspected it, Jonas inspected it for a good 10-15 minutes, we didn't find any other problems, we reassembled it, we recharged it, everything was fine, nothing broke, thank God, and we resumed testing for our final test. But this was at 620 volts, 55 percent power. Why did it stop? Black. Why did it stop? That wasn't what happened. <laughs> there you go. That's what happened. Oh, uh, That's sick. This is uh, approximately half power. Unfortunately, during this test, the projectile did get stuck on the rails and it did weld itself to the rails. <laughs> <laughs> which meant that although there's a very impressive muzzle flash, which is very fun and very exciting and very cool, which actually like lit up the entire underside of my deck, it didn't actually exit the barrel. So what we had to do after this, we had to open up the entirety of Hallmark, we had to sand down the rails, we had to sand down the projectile, and then everything was fine and dandy. Yes. We did not get a chance to test it after that though, because at that point it was like 10 o'clock at night and we just wanted to go home and go to <laughs> Yeah. Those were our tests. They're super awesome. We're not done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but there's more. But wait, there's more. So uh, yeah, the next slide. It, it is time. All right. So yeah, conclusion. Although we weren't able to obtain data, we did prove that the design works. It works fairly well, even though there are possibilities for improvement. There's more, but you know, you guys gotta go. Oh, we'll go over We can, we can, we can, we can finish it up tomorrow. It's okay. We have plenty of time.